Juan Enriquez is the managing director of Excel Venture Management, a venture capital firm that invests in life science companies. He was the founding director of the Life Sciences Project at Harvard Business School and a fellow at Harvard's Center for International Affairs. His work has been published in Harvard Business Review, Foreign Policy, Science, and the New York Times. He is the author of As the Future Catches You in the Untaught States of America. One was part of a world discovery voyage led by J. Craig Venter, discovering an unprecedented number of new species. He earned a BA and an MBA from Harvard, with honors. All right, so, if, is this on? So if I had any sense whatsoever, I'd talk about what I know, uh, which is life sciences. And I'd talk about a book I just published, Homo Evolutus, about the next human species. But instead of that, I'm, I'm worried enough and I'm angry enough that I'm going to go back 20 years to my old life when I was in Mexico. Um, and it turns out that I was one of the peace negotiators when the Zapatista Rebellion broke out. And I haven't talked about that for 20 years, and you're the first audience to see this talk. And you're seeing this talk because I'm angry. Um, I'm angry that one of the most beautiful places on Earth, a place that has absolutely incredible textiles and art, and culture and religion is also very full of poor people. And those folks have been oppressed for centuries and they've lived in a state of discrimination for centuries. This is a caste painting that tells you exactly where you stand. If you have two white Spaniards marrying each other, if you have a white Spaniard marrying a Mexican Spaniard, if you have two mulattoes, et cetera, it tells you exactly where you stand and that hasn't really changed for a lot of time. And this guy tried to change it. This guy became president of Mexico. He went to Harvard. He studied the Mexican Revolution. He studied land reform. He did his PhD thesis on land reform. And his hero was Emiliano Zapata, to the point where his firstborn was called Emiliano. His presidential plane was called Emiliano Zapata. And he went out and tried to reform Mexico by opening up and creating free trade treaties and signed the free tre treaty with Canada and Mexico. And the interesting thing is on the day that that treaty was implemented, these guys came out of the jungle in chapels. So you have this scene where in the presidential palace, they're all toasting with champagne the new NAFTA treaty, and these guys are marching into San Cristobal de las Casas, and they are not happy. And they're not happy, and the first thing they do is they go to the municipal palace, and they burn every land record because they believed in communal lands, they didn't believe in private lands, and they felt their lands had been taken. The second thing they did is they burned every court record because they felt the law and justice and the police and the courts had just been used against them. And in the midst of all this burning, this guy shows up on the mayor's office on the balcony. Nobody had ever seen this guy before. He called himself Subcomandante Marcos. And he had a sense of humor because the citizens of San Cristobal, some of whom were conservative enough that they make the conservative right in the states look liberal, are calling the mayor's office and this guy's answering the phone and they're screaming and yelling that there's these armed people running through the village and he's saying, oh, don't worry, we've got it all under control. <laughs> the second thing they did as they were taking out all the land records and stuff is they went to this guy's ranch. This is the previous governor of the state, a two-star general, and they kidnap him, and they take him off into the jungle. And he just disappears. That does not please the army. So, what do you do? How do you deal with an indigenous rebellion? Peace negotiator number one shows up. Peace negotiator number one is the Minister of Interior, Interior Security, Patrocinio Gonzalez. President, who's drinking champagne, calls him up, says, Patrocinio, you used to be the governor of Chiapas, you're now my Minister of Security. What's going on here? What do we do? Patrocinio's answer is, it's just a couple hundred Indians who can't speak Spanish, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it tonight. Patrocinio is a guy who, in a talk to the Harvard Club, said a few months previously, yeah, there's rumors of stuff in Chiapas, but not a leaf moves in the state if I don't approve it. It turns out the leaves were moving, and he didn't know. His solution was, 
keep the Indians in their place, just as they'd been doing for a while. But it turns out that these Indians were now armed and organized, and the president kept getting these increasingly frantic phone calls that said, they've not only taken over the town, they're now attacking the military barracks, and they're about to take them. Well, these are not 200 Indians. Why was this stuff going on in Chiapas? Well, because this was a really nasty neighborhood during the 1980s. You had the Sandinistas running around, you had the Contras in Honduras, you had the FMLN in Salvador, you had all the stuff going on in, Chiapa, in uh, Guatemala with the massacre of indigenous populations, and Chiapas was right next to that. So priority one is let's keep security. Priority number two is let's keep the status quo. A few decades before this rebellion, that's one of the governors of the state inaugurating the new statue of Diego de Mazariegos, the Spanish conquistador whose specialty was coming in and massacring Indians. And they thought it would be a really good idea in a state where most of the population is indigenous to stick a Spanish conquistador right in their face on the 500th anniversary of Columbus. The Indians did not like that statue, so what happened on the 1492, 1992 anniversary, was they marched into San Cristobal, carrying little wooden rifles. They converged on that statue, they pulled it down, then they went out and they picked up plastic bags and picked up all the trash from all the corners in San Cristobal. And that's the way they protested. And the governor said, finally, the FBI, the brute Indian force, did something useful. They picked up the trash. But there was a subtext to that, and that is, that that brute Indian force had practiced in broad daylight in front of the guy who ran security in the country, the takeover three years later of exactly who would stand on each street corner. And nobody had a clue. Within 24 hours, Patrocinio is gone because the president understands this is completely out of control. He wants the world to focus on NAFTA and the headlines are all this rebellion in Chiapas. So he moves to negotiator number two. We're now about 24 hours into this. This is General Golinas. General Golinas' proposal was, why don't we try this? And all of a sudden, all these airplanes start flying in, and all these troops start flying in, and this turns into a real shooting war. And the images become real images on television of planes bombing people who look like that. That is not a good image. This does not go away. In fact, there are images that look like this and you begin to get things that look like this. And you get tens of thousands of people that turn into hundreds of thousands of people protesting and marching for peace, for indigenous rights, and against NAFTA. So at that point, we're now about 72 hours into the story, you get rid of negotiator number two. In comes negotiator number three. Here's what he looks like. You guys are so incompetent, I'll just do it myself. Here's his proposal. Marcos, who was a very funny guy sometimes, had a quick answer to this one. And having answered that, then he puts out a communique, and that communique was absolutely brutal. This is a summary of several pages of one of the most brutal documents you've ever read. Here's how many people have died, here's where they've died, here's how they've died of hunger, here's the schools that aren't here, here's how you take 30% of our gas, here's how you take our jungles, here's how you kick us out, here's how you burn down our villages, and you're telling us that you're about to forgive? For what? And the rest of the commanders appear. Because Marcos is a sub-commander, but it turns out that this is a rebellion of various ethnic indigenous groups in Chiapas and they're running the show. And at that point, you get negotiator number four. We are now about 10, 11 days into this conflict. You've run through four peace negotiators. This is the Minister of Social Affairs. Here's his proposal. I have bags of cash. I'll buy you out. What do you want? Whatever it takes. Want schools? Want houses? What, what do you want? Just tell you what, I'll set up a desk right here in front of the cathedral, and you just form a line and ask. The only problem was that there was a cordon around San Cristobal, and these guys were shooting at anything that moved. 
So not a lot of people showed up. In fact, nobody showed up for proposal number four. And you're now the main story on the evening news. And all these Indians are getting bombed. There's bombs in Mexico City. People are protesting. You've got uprisings in other part of the country. This is getting scary. Now what do you do? Well, at that point, you go to this guy. This is negotiator number five. He's the Secretary of State. I'm working for this guy. He and I have been trying to reform Mexico's political system for about 12 years. We've been writing op-eds. We've become really unpopular with the government because they were arguing you should open the democracy after you restructure the economy. We were arguing it has to be done at the same time. He has a heart-to-heart -heart with the president, and it's basically, I'm sitting outside of the presidential palace with instructions, if I don't come out in 45 minutes, take your family, take my family, get out of the country, because I've been arrested. And his proposal is, you fire about a third of the hard line, about a third of the cabinet. We will not take a government salary appointment. There will be no official planes. There will be no security. And you're going to back the democratic reforms immediately. Or I'm going to resign tonight and run the peace marches in the streets. Enough of this bombing of Indians. Because they're right. Because what they're asking for is just. And we're on the wrong side of the story. So we write a speech, which is the first communique. We finish at 4.30 in the morning. We go to sleep for an hour. Phone rings. A gentleman who will remain unnamed but was very important to the government calls me up and says, Juan, you know, there is no death penalty in Mexico except for treason. Click. OK. We get on the plane the next morning, fly to San Cristobal, and the guy who meets us is the guy that the hardline is blaming for the rebellion, who's the Bishop of Chiapas. Bishop of San Cristobal de San Maurice. And instead of using the army, we use the tradition of the church sometimes protecting indigenous populations. And there, there's different factions within the church. This was one of the more liberal ones. We get into the bishop's car, we drive over to the radio station, we get on the radio station and we issue an apology and basically we say, you have a right to fight. If we were in your shoes, we would be fighting. You have a right to be angry. Mexico owes you, and at this point, we still think it's better to talk, understanding that we are in the wrong. We do this in seven indigenous languages. It's the first time that indigenous languages have been used on state radio because all these dumb Indians were supposed to learn Spanish. We didn't respect their languages enough to put it on the radio. The other thing we do is we announce a unilateral ceasefire. You guys can keep shooting. We're not going to shoot anymore. We're just going to stop. And that really throws this guy for a loop. And at that point, you begin a transition to at least start stopping the shooting. It becomes illegitimate for their side to continue shooting. So an interesting way of dealing with violence. You create a ceasefire. They create some indigenous towns. And this guy starts the transition from an armed revolutionary into a flowered revolutionary. And this becomes his weapon. And he starts writing a series of very powerful communiques. It becomes the first 21st century war of ink and internet instead of bullets. And the legend grows. And this is a very hard guy to dialogue with. First, he didn't talk face to face for months. But second, you'd send back communiques understanding that you've lost four peace negotiators in hours by saying the wrong thing. We eventually get to the point where we agree that we're going to start talking. and it, it was a long, hard road to do that. But the first thing we've got to do is we've got to get this general back, because otherwise the army's not going to back off. Only small issue is this general's been condemned to death for some of the stuff he pulled off against the Indians. So we go into a series of very complicated negotiations. Eventually, we have a prisoner exchange in the forest, that is the general being greeted by Samuel. Manuel Camacho is on the left. We start working on the logistics with the Red Cross of bringing Marcos into San Cristobal without his being killed. This is his arrival in the cathedral. 
we held each other hostage in the cathedral. We couldn't leave, he couldn't leave. That way nobody could take them out without taking the other group out. And the talks begin, and the talks last a long time. Because the first thing you've got to do with people who've been angry and oppressed for 500 years is to listen and listen and listen and listen. And sometimes you're talking about stuff that happened 132 years ago. Sometimes you're talking about stuff that happened 48 hours ago. Sometimes you're talking about stuff that happened 1,000 years ago. There is not a linear concept of time in these populations. Make a very long story short, eventually we reach a peace agreement. The Zapatista flag gets substituted by the Mexican flag, which of course is a concern where you have separatist movements. We reach that agreement, we take Marcos back into the jungle. They begin a peace offensive. We begin to force reforms in Mexico. The hard line goes absolutely crazy. And one of the things that happens is the presidential candidate gets killed. And the hard line turns around and says, see, because you negotiated peace, the whole country just went to shit. And the hard line comes back in. And that hasn't been working terribly well. Because when you go back to San Cristobal, and this is the team that I originally took with me, um, there were four of us as part of Manuel Camacho's team, and these folks were working for me, Oscar Arguelles, Enrique Marquez, Luis Sanchez, Chiapas is still a very poor place. It's still a place where the Zapatistas are in all the markets and are still admired. But the military's back in the streets. And the military's back in the streets to an extent that is absolutely unprecedented because of the drug wars. And as the US goes out and liberalizes a bunch of this stuff, we have a real shooting match in Mexico where it is one of the most dangerous places on earth to give a talk like this to be a reporter, to be an official. And the stuff that was going on in Chiapas is now going on across a whole series of towns in Mexico, partly under the guise of fighting drugs, but there's a lot of scores being settled. And in the meantime, the US is building this absolutely enormous Berlin Wall and absolutely ignoring the stuff that's going on. So why am I giving this talk instead of talking about life sciences and companies and evolution of humanity, because I'm angry. Because as I look across the world at what we're doing to indigenous communities in the Middle East, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Chiapas, in Central America, in Brazil, it makes me furious that we're not picking up on the lessons of how you deal with people. And the first way you deal with people is you give them respect. And you listen. And you recognize when you're wrong. And in more and more countries, we're using bullets instead of words. And I can tell you the only reason why that is a ceasefire that holds today is because we respected people, we understood where we were wrong, we used words, and we said, I'm sorry, and we said it in a way that people listen. And we gave them the time to talk, and we gave them respect. And in too many conflicts, in too many places today, we're using option number one, which is just kill them. And that doesn't work. And I'm angry. So that's why I gave this talk. Thank you.